Um, I was glad that she only spent a brief amount of time in the chapter today on what it is, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so this book really is where we're at. We we know what it is. We want to yeah. know, you know, how to move it forward. So, so chapters three and four this time. Um, starting with chapter three, I can't remember what I had for questions. I but know. Anything stand out to people? Um, oh, I I liked. She really focused on the ongoing. So the question was, how do you um, do this or plan to do this with your PD to make it ongoing, not that one-time thing? Um, and I just thought that would be great if, if people had great ways that they do that or plan to do that. Well, I Molly, I think that is the ultimate key. It's also up to the district. Yeah. You know, because we've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of things, and, and you guys may have too, with one-to-one -one rollouts where there's the training prior to, there's the training during deployment, and then it stops. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's none of the after, and you need some of that after to keep going. And, you know, I think that's where some schools maybe got in a little bit of a bind this spring, is because they did the prior to, the during, and then they stopped and thought that some of those things would be in place when they weren't. Yeah. Um, except yeah. for those that have done some of the blended learning stuff and, and doing that and have that repeated exposure and you try and tell them that, but then the next new flashy bright thing comes up that they have to do or that is required for them to do or whatever. And it, some things just kind of get pushed off to the wayside. And it's, I don't think it's just with blended. I think it's just about with any, right. any initiative that they try and start. Is it once they get to, Oh, we've got it deployed. All right, we're good enough then. Let's, yeah, yeah. you know, we're good on Marzano. No, you got to keep going with Marzano and Dash. You got to keep going with it. You just can't right. stop it. And have you guys found a way to keep your foot in the door? Um, <laughs> Stephanie's like shaking her head no. And that's, we just really, we do, we struggle with that too. You know, same with the Marzano, you know, um, you should be doing rounds. So maybe we come out and, and help once with rounds and they do it once and they're done. You know, and it's not, it's, it should be continual, but. That's definitely been our biggest struggle with, even with the blended learning pilot, like trying to move it forward. Mm -hmm. A lot of our districts, like we can't even get in for any in-services, let alone something that we would be able to take back over and over and over again. Um, we, we've just really struggled with that. So I was trying not to get disheartened when I read this chapter because she mm -hmm. just, like, that's the only way. And I'm like, Oh no, <laughs> if that's the only way, we're screwed. <laughs> so uh, I'm hoping that uh, there's, there's some, some, one of you other folks has a genius idea for <laughs> districts to let us in. I'll be right back. Sorry, there's a guy here spraying and I just need to do something real quick. I'll be right back. Well, one thing that st stuck out at me when I was reading was all of the research and numbers backing up the effectiveness of, of this approach, the ongoing approach. And we really push to admin and educators to use data with their students. So, I mean, I think in my brain, I just really want to reinforce the why with data. And then, you know, the what should, should, you know, back up, the data live in action in the school and i'm to the point now where i've, I've got a year under my belt and i'm not going to and we have a different situation because we're out here in the boonies we have really small schools with really small um about that. so i'm just going to say it, it's not going to be an option i'm just going to say when can i come and i'm going to try it <laughs> or you know, after we do our PLCs, after we give the spark, after we show the, the why with the data, I'm at least going to ask for some ideas and say, okay, I'm going to be in your building this time every week or twice a week or whatever. And I'm going to push a little bit harder. That's the way I feel. Thoughts? Well, I, I like that, you know, because that's when I first started ESU 7, that's something I did with tech integration, going out and saying, hey, I'm going to be out on this day for teachers to ask me anything that they want. Um, and we started with a document, but it didn't start that way, but it came to a document to put so I could know who I wanted to talk to. But it got to a point where I was spending three hours in a district and I wasn't seeing a teacher at all. 
you know, because yeah. there's so many other things. But I also think back to one of Stephanie's points too, I think seeing some of our districts going with fewer and fewer professional development days. And they're trying to cram as much as they can that school based in on those yeah. that they're not leaving time for us, yet they don't want their teachers to leave the buildings either to come for PD. Mm -hmm. um, and they still have their professional growth. And in the summers, they don't want to do it either because there's time off. I, it's the, it's the double-edged sword it kind is. of thing. And one thing I'm almost thinking of doing too, and I've done it with several schools, is I've taken the blended rubric that we've used for cohort two and stuff like that and gone out to schools and just popped into rooms. School had said, hey, we want you to come out and just pop into rooms and give us ideas. So I popped into rooms and I filled out that rubric to give me some information too, to share with the districts of here's what I saw. And I think some of that and maybe using that same rubric or adapting it a little bit uh, is one of those ways to also get some data to show, hey, here's what's happening. Is the training that we did being followed through with or is it a one shot done? But it also, I think, depends on how much time we're given. Um, you know, at the beginning of school, we may only have an hour, yeah. you know, and how can we do a, a good blended learning training in a blended learning format in an hour? Right. Yeah. We kind of have done a little bit of that with the Elliot for the advanced ed, um, you know, gone out and done with call mock Elliot's and, and then that gives them data and us data. And then, um, I've had a really great principal take that then. And, um, for his weekly teacher meetings, they focus on one. Just, you know, what is, should this look like or what could it look like in a classroom and things like that. So he's kind of doing a little of the PD, but um, I think you just hit on something, Otis, and it was something I highlighted that said professional development is more effective when it uses the same strategies in training that it aims to teach the teachers. Well, Lori and I were meeting this morning for our future ready um, presentation that's 25 minutes <laughs> on engagement strategies for elementary. And we're like, how how do we do this plus you know it's digital how do we and and make it engaging in 25 minutes and still cover content and it's tough well, part of it and then like the other said, we don't get to design our time place space all that kind of stuff and that's that, that's hard yeah mm -hmm. you know and it that just you know teacher mastery of a new skill takes on average 20 separate instances of practice yeah, How are you going to okay. get 20 instances of practice in 25 minutes? And like you made a point there, Molly, you know, we're given a space. Yeah. There's a school that we go out to, no matter what building we go in, it's in a gym. Yeah. Or I have a long rectangular lunch room that has the lunch tables in it. You know, yeah. we don't get to help design that space to make that mm -hmm. easy because of what it is. Whereas at the service units, we can control that a little bit to a point as yeah. to what we want. Um, like I'm doing a blended learning training. I was going to do it over two days. I'm still doing it over two days, but via Zoom, uh, half day each day rather than full days. And I did it last year and I was able to set the room the way that I wanted to. Yeah. I'm not going to set it the way I want to right now, but I'm going to make it work. Are you well, going maybe, to your room? Oh, to sorry. No, I was going to say, are you going into the room where you would have done it to do it or are you going to do it from home? No, uh, one day I'll be from home. Uh, the next day I'll be from in the office because that may be our last day with a limit of 10 mm -hmm. in the office. Cause we're limiting to 10 right now with no outside visitors. So, yeah. Yeah. Stephanie, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say, you know, as I kind of thought through how could we do this at ESU 17, I think like maybe my approach would be, I have one principle that I think like, would be my hope. You know, I have one principal who I think has enough buy-in that they would let me come in more often. I'm not going to get to the 20 or the 50 that Catlin talks about, but more often. And so, you know, maybe you start with your one principal and then if it goes well, you know, I don't know how your, your areas are, but Stephanie, ours is kind of the same. We're really rural and lots of small schools. So they all talk, they all lean on each other for guidance. And so I think if you could get in in one spot and do a good job, and get people excited, there would be the possibility of, you know, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but maybe three or four years down the road, you know, you kind of gain traction. So you might get there. It just might be a really slow process. My, yeah. mother, 
success story. Oh, go ahead, Peg. You want to share yours first? I was going to say real quick, um, when we, the pilot hadn't started yet, but we, some of us from ESU 10 invited a couple of our districts to go with us to Lawrence, Kansas, because it was kind of right after we had seen the folks from Lawrence, Kansas at um, distance learning conference. And um, so Centura is one of them, just down the road from me right now. And um, they were really interested in it. And then so Broken Bow was the other one. They both were very, very interested, but Broken Bow is the one that really took off at first. And they um, bought in and they got the round tables for the, it was the fifth grade teachers, their math team was going to do it or do it for math. And um, they kind of rewrote their Saxon curriculum to work with blended learning. They just changed the order in which they taught things. Um, and then Centura kind of didn't do it, but now Broken Bow's kind of like fell off a little bit. <laughs> and now we, I just got an email from the principal at Centura who they really want to implement it almost district wide next year. So I'm kind of excited. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had a school that um, they took a department, science department was in one of the cohorts. And um, so we worked with the science department that year. And then um, they were like, oh, you got to come talk to the math department. And so they already had PLC. So then we talked to the math department and some of them did, some of them didn't. Well, then pretty soon um, they scheduled us to talk to the um, social studies department and then the language arts department. And all of this happened grassroots. I don't think the superintendent ever knew that I was coming for that. I mean, it was, it was the teachers saying, you know, and there was one gal that she kind of organizes their PLCs um, just to make sure that they're having something to do in their PLCs and stuff. And she would say, okay, um, you know, social studies said you can come to this PLC. They, they're, you know, good with that and stuff. And so um, it, it prop, no, it's not a school wide by any means, but it just really grew out of the success from one department. Mm -hmm. and the kids talking about it and then um so that was really fun but that is the only school i've had that kind of success in um i wish it would and i think that makes complete sense you know right it was teacher wanting and stuff but i feel the same way I and mean, that's what makes it hard for us with esu where we work with different districts and and you might have those and we keep talking we always say we have pockets of teachers and that's just maybe the way it's going to be the best traction we had at esu 10 with anything was our used to be adolescent literacy project. But in terms of the implementation with the folks that came for the training and the number of times we had them at ESU 10 and then the number of times we went out into their classrooms, it was like, I think we had four trainings the first few years, we had four. I mean, that's a lot of out of the building. But then we went and visited them probably at least four times, if not more. And um, they actually had teams of teachers, you know, going into each other's classrooms and the administrator was bought in in fact the administrators had the training those first few years before and then it just it, again it it got to be where they're well in some cases districts were a lot of their teachers were trained in it that didn't mean they were well implementing implementing the strategies but it was still they kept sending and they kept sending but we were now to down we still do in the project but we only offer our training or not offer but there's two trainings instead of four so we've kind of crammed four days into two and um, hang on, I'll finish my story later. <laughs> Somebody else is at the door. Okay. <laughs> so how many administrators come to your trainings? Because she talked about that in the book too, to really keep the ball rolling. Administrators need to know what the teachers are concerned about, their questions, their... Well, that's, that's, be on board. that's interesting out in the buildings because sometimes they're there, sometimes they'll pop in and then they'll leave. You know, and that just, if, I think that's a key, if the administrator's there, the teachers are going to take it more seriously than if they're not. If the administrator's not there, they're going to like, oh, well. And I think kind of to what Peg was saying too a little bit is, we have a great opportunity right now with what's happened the last two, three months. Mm -hmm. You know, and how do we keep that going? Because I had, I have an interim superintendent coming into one of our districts who, um, was an ESU 7 board member called me on the work the other day and said hey who can do this you know type of training to help us get going I go I can do it Doug <laughs> perfect 
we're going to look at some dates. Maybe you can come out and kind of do this to kind of, hey, how can we push ourselves forward and, and push everybody forward? But they've had a lot of staff turnover this year, too. I think they're getting like at least 10 total new teachers in a small district. Wow. Um, seven or eight of them are in the, uh, in the high school. Both the entire English department left, wow. you know. Oh, my gosh. You know, and one of them was a blended learning, one of our blended learning rock stars in the state. So, who has the interim superintendent? Uh, Shelby. Oh, where did he go? Where did Ms. Dr. Or Chips go? Chip Mr. is Dr. going Dr. to take over the uh, basically kind of the human resources financial at Columbus Public. He's replacing Dave Melick, who retired. Oh, Dave retired. Didn't yeah. Know. Yeah, Dave retired. So, Chip's coming up here to Columbus. I, I see. That's too bad. He was an excellent superintendent, I thought. Yeah, Chip was. Yeah, yeah. And not that but he won't be. I've known, Chip, I've known Chip since I was out in Sutherland. Yeah. Because he was in Ogallala for a little bit and then Perkins County. So. Yeah. Cool. I just hadn't heard that there was an interim. So that had nothing to do with yeah. what. Peg, you want to finish your story? Um, Where you were? <laughs> well, I think I was just saying, so now we're down and we only offer two trainings and crammed it into two days. And we're still, the numbers are dwindling off and it, there's a lot of reason for it. And it's some who have new administrators who haven't, you know, don't really know what it is. We have, they don't, several of our schools are like what Oda said. They don't want to let teachers out of their building too much because when they do, it's stuff they have to. And we're like, you know, some of those mandated things that they have to go to. Um, and we're not really going in, we're not doing anything like what, you know, Catlin would be doing in a district. But if we can get the, I don't know, if we can get, somehow capitalize on this and maybe even do our training virtually and maybe that would help. And it's, again, it's condensing it and instead of full day workshops, it's shorter ones and more often. And it might, you know, we might really be able to, to do this. Yeah. I, so they had that um, little four step, explain it, see it, discuss it, try it, which is something mm -hmm. we probably learned early on in our um, teaching development career. It makes sense. We use it with our kids. But I was thinking about putting that into action virtually because so sometimes I think when I move away to a virtual I don't necessarily do all the steps mm -hmm. but um, was it yesterday that the DAP project coaches met and they were putting their stuff um, into the OER and um, I was on there for a while but it was really um, I, you know, and it didn't, they had been working in this project for quite a while. There was the incentive you have to upload these of your students to get your paid and those kind of things or, the, or your teachers that you coach. But um, they started out a little bit of intro. Um, they talked about the OER um, and then they gave them time to work and everybody was on there. And if they had questions about something or didn't understand a standard, you know, they would throw it out or they would do a chat and a couple of them might go into a breakout session and then come back. And, and I just thought, you know, that's, that's really, it was a really, I thought, very successful couple hours and they got a lot of work done. Most of them were completely done. There was questions answered as they, they went. So it kind of, they explained it, they saw it, how it was supposed to do it, they discussed it and then they got to do it and upload those. And, um, so I thought, oh, I need to, to take note of how this went because mm -hmm. it, I thought it was really successful. And granted, there was a little, it was the end of the project. So they'd been, you know, wasn't like the first time they had ever seen any of it, but it was good. And that might be the wave of the future. I mean, yeah, if an admin doesn't want teachers leaving the building and teachers don't have time um, we have devices and technology that we could really go through that coaching cycle almost completely virtually, even though that's not optimal, that, that would break my heart, but it's, it's there. Mm -hmm. so maybe teachers would be more receptive and admin would be more receptive um, to the process if, if we had um, the blended model, uh, not the blended model, what, um, like the flipped classroom model kind of. Yeah that way uh, with the coaching model? I don't know. I, I will say I've done some of our cognitive coaching stuff via Zoom with things. 
my gosh, for the coaching side, I, I like to be in person. You know, it works via Zoom. But if I'm actually coaching a person, I'd rather be face to face with them. I would say, though, Otis, cognitive, you're really yeah. playing a lot off of body language and rapport and yeah. speech, where this coaching, you're planning a lesson, you know, it's not, I mean, I think yeah. this would be easier to do online. And then they like record themselves and you sit down and watch it together or something. Well, I, I agree with that. I agree with that, Molly. But I also think there's something to be said being face to face with them when you're doing some of that lesson planning. Um, you know, yes, there are parts that can be done virtual. I, I totally get that. And, you know, watching and, and getting some of those things. But I always, I still, even if I'm blend ed coaching, I revert to the cognitive pieces. Uh, a little bit and the questioning stuff. Um, yes, virtual so we can model some of that, but also looking at face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and then there was another thing I was going to add to, you know, where we do a lot of our trainings and things, if we can get also other staff developers to blend their trainings and do the rotations in their trainings. I know we're doing that a lot of that here uh, as well. And mm -hmm. getting some of those other trainings so that other people are using it as well, just besides mm -hmm. those of us that are doing some of it, um, that kind of creates some of that systemic, systematic flow out as well. We, um, last year when we were, first time we had a, our administrators into our new building for our meeting, we um, basically rotated them through different rooms of the new building and covered different materials at each of the rooms. Um, and yeah, they're like, this was great. We, we were up and we were moving and we're like, hello. <laughs> but yeah. Anything no, else? No. Three, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, have any of you guys ever experienced, you know, it's kind of funny because a lot of times when we have tried to do, um, you know, more of the blended model in our trainings, we get teacher pushback, just like the kids push back those first times you try it. You know, teachers kind of want to do sit and get. Like, I think they get out of their districts and they're tired and they just want you to talk to them. So do you guys have any um, good tips for kind of dealing with, with teacher pushback when you only get to see them once or twice and you want to make the most of your time? She talked about that in the book actually, because when you use the model with the teachers and, you know, say in a flipped classroom model, they didn't do their pre-work. So mm -hmm. you, you do have to think through it and then they get to see, and hopefully you would address that and bring it back to connect it to what they would see in the classroom as a teacher too. So I thought that was an interesting way to look at it and it made me think about preparing for the teachers because we've done the blended model last year for our PLCs and some of the teachers looked at us like we're not going to do this <laughs> and I was kind of unprepared and you know um, after she talked about it in um, in the chapter I am going to revert it back to or help them think about them dealing with the same situation in their classroom. Mm -hmm. I thought very helpful. What is that? I, you know, we see it, and you guys may feel this too. Sometimes teachers make the worst students. <laughs> yes, they do. That's <laughs> we, you know. do teachers, I, and I'm including me too. We do everything that we would not want our class to do. You know, and because it's administrative worse it, than teachers too. Yeah, it's just. <laughs> You know, because you have your coaches sitting over in the corner planning practice and, you know, you, we see all that. And it's, you know, it's all about that engagement and, and keeping them going and saying, hey, this is something that's going to, in a way, take some things off of your plate. Yes. You know, because there's a shift. Elementary is doing this. And it's when they get into middle school, high school, that it's, hey, kids, we're going to sit and get. You're used to up moving around in elementary. We're sit and get now. You know, there's that, how do you, in a way, and, and I was the same way. I'll admit it. I was as a secondary teacher. But how do we get that elementary mindset into some secondary teachers that, that are set in their ways? Well, this isn't the way I've always done it, or this isn't the way that I was taught, or this isn't the way. How do we bring some of that? 
elementary mindset into the secondary side of things. I wonder where the disconnect is between the data that shows what works. I mean, if you, if you think about Dr. Hattie or the people that she cited in this book, the data shows that these things work. We've had the um, blessing of being able to study it for years and actively researching it in the classroom. So when I say, you know, when you include social emotional learning programs in your school, you see, uh, you know, almost potential, um, almost um, not guaranteed, but there's a potential for 11% growth in student achievement. And there's still that, no, we're not going to do it because it's just one more new thing. But student outcomes are our focus. So I struggle with getting people to, or, you know, colleagues to understand that if this is what works, can we try it and see if it works for us? Because the data shows that it does, but they're still just so set in their ways. Nope, we're not going to do it. It's not going to work for us. Well, until we try, it's not. Nothing's going to work. No. So it's pushing them outside their comfort zone. Part. I think it's that's a lot them of it. outside their comfort zone and they're not liking it. Yeah, I think that's a lot of it. And, and comfort and um, it's easier and faster the way I've always been doing it, you know? And so it's, it, it's really um, back to the leadership challenged. I think, you know, if the leadership is buying and challenging their teachers to be better, um, it, it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna keep on. There you go. All right, how about chapter four? It's the first chapter that kind of gets into the coaching part of it. And um, she talks a little bit about the different uh, types of blended learning. And she refers back to that blended le learning coaching style that we saw in chapter two. Um, thoughts? I love, I'm just gonna say one thing. She several times talks about the teacher becomes an architect of learning experiences. I just love that phrase. And I, I like three or four times. So I want it to become part of my vocabulary that teachers need to become architects of learning experiences. So well, and that's what I love about, you know, it's still back in chapter three, but just you know, yeah. the the station rotation that she simplifies with the online experience and a collaboration experience and maybe another online experience and a teacher led and, and you break up so that you, they're not doing online or individual back to back. And it's just that architect of the experiences and, and it gives students so many different ways. And I, I just feel like, um, I know that the teachers are having success with blended learning. They've bought into that, that, and it, yeah, it might seem like, a, or it is a lot of work at first, but, just the benefits to make it so worth it yeah the kids are more engaged they're getting the content they're all those yeah. kind of <clears throat> I like when i did it the last year of teaching it i wish i would have known about it 10 years ago because it gave me so much more time to differentiate and scaffold and spend the time that i needed with individual kids i was just like oh my gosh why didn't somebody tell me about this so long ago mm -hmm. and that's where I'm trying to remind teachers that, you know, they complain about not having enough time to differentiate, to plan, to do what they need to do. What, well, this model really helps you with that. And it takes uh, a lot of, or it gives a lot of the um, control over, I mean, it's student centered. It gives mm -hmm. the control and it allows you time to do the work that we love to do is help, help kiddos succeed. So you need to remind them of that. I like that phrase architect too, Molly, and I think it's especially um, very poignant at this time when we're facing possibly not starting school regular and, you know, people have been forced into this online learning environment because it really suggests that being intentional and really thinking through things. I mean, not saying that people just wing it when they go into the classroom. I know that they're intentional in their classrooms too, but when you're doing the online learning, you have to be even more so, and you really have to think about how you're delivering things effectively and how you're reaching all the students. So I, I, I also highlighted that phrase because I thought, especially right now during all this COVID-19 stuff, it's, it's a very powerful phrase. Did anyone see, um, I put in the announcement that podcast, um, the announcement. Did anybody listen to that? Katie had right. sent that to me, and I, um, I thought especially for now, just some of the little tips. And I know they've been doing it at that school for a long time, but 
how they have two tracks. They have traditional, and then they have their, what they call their blended learning track. Um, and I'm thinking that we may be in face-to-face -face and online at the same time, you know? Um, and then kids that come to school and design their schedule daily, <sighs> amazing. Um, you know, based on what they need, because they're tracking their own learning and progress. I just, I know they're a lot farther, but there were some really good points in it. And so mm -hmm. um, if you get a chance to listen to, plus Catlin, when she talks, she's just so calm. I can mm -hmm. put it all the time. <laughs> I got to listen to that. Thanks for putting that in there. Um, I was just, I've been thinking about this whole thing too, about starting up in the fall and, and then blended learning and how, what Otis said before about, you know, we have a chance to capitalize on this mm -hmm. and we've come so far with our blended learning and then the digital age pedagogy and, and all the lessons and the templates and just where well, there's so much now that I feel like we can support our teachers in it. If we can't get in their classroom, um, it may not work, you know, for some districts or from some teachers might not be willing, but I feel like we have, you know, we just do have a lot of potential to really help move forward. Well, I, I agree, Peg, and I think one of those things to help get us, you know, kind of back to where, how do we get our foot in the door, even if it's with teachers and stuff, and it was one that I had highlighted on, it's on kind of in the middle of page 45. Uh, the coaching relationship must be built on a foundation of respect and trust. Um, it's at the middle of the paragraph right above the, the elements of effective coaching piece. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's where it is. And even when I'm blend ed coaching, um, yeah, I'll talk to administration, but I'm not going to go in and let's just say I'm, I'm watching Peg's class. I'll watch Peg's class. I'm not going to go right to the administrator and go in and close the door and have a closed door conversation because that shows, oh, I'm going in and saying exactly what Peg's doing. You know, so I try and keep a separate line there so that it's, hey, I'm not in here to evaluate or be an evaluator. I'm in here to help you improve and share with me the things you're struggling with and I'll help you. And I'm not going to go run to your administrator and say, Oh, take struggling with this. And, you know, unless, unless it's something really, really egregious that I would have to by law, I try not to do that. And it's that way that helps build some of that respect and trust between teachers, especially that trust with opening up. I'm struggling with station time station notation. I need help with this. What can I do? Well, mm -hmm. let me come in and watch, give you a few ideas. They're more, if you have that trust and that respect and relationship, they're going to be more open with you of, Hey, here's what I'm struggling with. What can I do? Then if you're one of those, that's going to go run right to the administration. Then the administration comes and talks to them about it. Absolutely. Um, I thought the three points that she made, the challenges are, I can just see, I don't have very many schools that have coaches, but those that do, um, they're more of a reading coach or a specific type of coach yeah. schools, or just maybe a tech integrationist. But um, I see that too, Nate. So then I thought, well, to us, how does that, I sometimes feel like I'm not relevant anymore because I'm not in the trenches as much. So I would love to do some more team teaching and things like that, you know, and usually the summer gives us a little opportunity. We'll do some summer school stuff or things like that, you know, but uh, obviously not this year, <clears throat> but um, as far as actually teaching and so forth. So um, I thought those were all really good points um, to keep in mind. Yeah. That is good. I feel that way sometimes too, Molly. And, and that kind of goes back to that um, on page 44, that Venn diagram where, you know, to get that trusting relationship, I think a, a teacher kind of needs to feel that the blended learning coach is an experienced educator. And, and I think that trained coach, I mean, it, I have a lot of technology integration specialists that are technology integration specialists because they're um, interested in technology and they're good at technology, but that coaching part is pretty important too. So um, I like that Venn diagram. You know, I'd like to try, sorry, I was just saying, I like to try to get a couple of our people to come if they, if they'll, their districts will pay for it. You know, and, and kind of on that coaching piece with the technology integration folks, it's maybe instead of going in, this is something you might want to try. They're going in and you should try this. You should try that. It's a lot of shoulding mm -hmm. rather than 
hey, here are a couple ideas. And I think there was a point, I can't remember whether it was in chapter three or in this one. It might've been in chapter three a little bit, but it's, it's even something I share in my sessions is find one thing, get good at it. Yeah. And I, that's some of the PD and the coaching pieces. Let's find one thing, let's get really good at it, and then we'll add something else rather than jump feet first into a 12 foot pool with 15 pound weights around each ankle. Um, let's walk in the zero entry you know, and slowly get up yeah. to where we need to be. And that may be the coaching piece too, is, is how can we slowly work ourselves in with a little bit of the coaching model and then get bigger and bigger and bigger too. And that might buy, help with some buy-in for teachers and or districts. I just want to clarify, I don't want to go back to be a classroom teacher full time. <laughs> not what I meant. Or I know, Molly. Every time I think that, then somebody says something about like a parent or <laughs> something like that, you know, <laughs> or concession stands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, no. I just, and I think that we can stay relevant by what we do and that's how we do it. You know, yeah. things we work with our teachers, we listen and so forth. But, um, I don't think it would be very hard to get completely out of the loop either. Mm -hmm. So I have to tell you, Susan Evans, um, she's just funny because she always thinks that she's not tech savvy and stuff like that, but she's one of the first ones to try stuff. And when we went into our stay at home kind of thing, she actually took on, it was either two or three kids that she was, um, working with on, a, on reading on zoom sessions and it was like her nephew's kid and um teresa rita olson's nephew or somebody like that so somebody that she kind of knew but i don't know how often they met but she's doing the letter i think it was with the letters training that she's been working on oh, so she was yeah. getting the certification and i mean just jump diving right in you know and doing these online sessions and the kids were really doing great and she was you know it was great for her to do it in that kind of setting I love it. Yeah. yeah, I think we saw great things. I just was telling one of my gals here this morning that if we don't, we as in everybody, come out as a better teacher or a better whatever, then we've wasted a great pandemic because there's no reason that <laughs> this shouldn't have made you better. You were forced into um you know teaching better maybe it's gonna make you better when you go back face to face maybe you're gonna have more empathy for you know maybe parents are gonna have more empathy for teachers whatever it is um but i think that and otis said that too it's a prime time to take advantage of this circumstances and um be better when it also made 20 plus year veteran teachers feel like rookies again and remember what it's like to just come back into the profession and not know what you're doing yeah exactly kind of it it was kind of a reminder like oh that's what that felt like 20 years ago i had a principal i ran into her the other day and she said that they had a a guy retiring after how many years or whatever i mean he could have retired quite a while ago when this all happened he's like yeah but i don't have to do this and she's like you you're still gonna finish out your contract right yeah you do have to do this you know you got to figure it out. Um, but yeah, he, it was, she said he may, probably didn't do it great, but he did do it. So anything else? I didn't remember what my questions were. Um, Oh, this is good. And this is timely. How does the shifting from a traditional teaching model to blended learning models impact both the teacher and student roles in the classroom? And I think that um, what we've just gone through sheds light on that, that um, it's not only what we just went through affected the teachers, the students, the parents, everybody's role. And so I think that um, that's important to remember uh, you know, and I've heard so many people say, you know, some kids like this, some kids don't, 
those kids that thrived and worked, what are we going to do for them? Are we going to put them back into a face-to-face -face lecture all day long? The sit and get, where some kids want that. They don't want to work hard. They don't want to, you know, but those that have experienced this new freedom and control over their learning, how are we going to accommodate them in the future? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. To add, you know, because it, it is, you know, I've even heard that, that some things that kids have taken control of their own learning now and, and realize that what they can do and have gotten that voice, those kids that haven't spoke up and spoke up a whole lot in a in a regular classroom have done a heck of a lot more in the virtual setting. Yeah. Um, I really hope we keep asking and involving the kids and, and listening to their voices especially moving forward because I think they would have some I mean obviously wonderful insight but maybe some very creative ways that we can meet just like you said both those kids uh, kind of kids needs and help teachers see maybe some different things help administrators see some different choices that our adult brains would never have uh, come up with so I think student voice is very very important moving forward and I think if a kid really thrived in this online environment and they go back and that teacher starts to lecture every day for 40 minutes that they push back, I hope those kids use their voice to push back because um, learning doesn't need to be that way. Yeah. Yeah, especially in this day and age. Yeah. And after what we just, because it wasn't this way for three months, so now why does it have to go back to the old way? It doesn't. Shouldn't. And they're, they're going to ask and they are going to push back. Yeah. I hope so. They're going to challenge their teachers to be better, I think. I hope. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I know I had a district that went to PBL a couple of years ago. And there's one teacher that even made the comment to me saying, I'm just doing my one a semester to jump through the hoop. Was it in rows lecture for 45, 50 minutes? I'm doing my PBL just so that I don't get called out. Hopefully they get called out. Wake up a call, a little bit of a wake up call and then they get called out not only by the administration, but by the kids. That's what wow. I'm saying. Yeah. I think we're, this has given kids some voice and I have heard about so many kids that were working jobs and then doing this schoolwork, you know, on the side. And so, and that's somebody else I listened to. They said, if kids were doing their full day's work in, two and a half, three hours, why are we requiring them to go the whole time again, you know? So can we get back in there so that it's more flexible? Um, especially, you know, I think of like high school, junior, seniors even, giving them some work release type things, things we used to do, not so much yeah. anymore. I did work release. Um, it started, oh, car going by, sorry. It started the conversation around here about the four-day school week. Yeah. I don't know how far the conversation has gone, but I've seen just uh, with our admin and our teachers, it percolating up in conversation. So I thought that was interesting too. You know, apologize for that. <laughs> Anybody else have any content, comments, questions? I will uh, throw this recording in the resources and um, then uh, my follow-up I'll just use your email that you'd sent to everybody, Peg, that that's where it is if anybody wants to look at it and maybe okay. link there. So, but all right, have a great weekend. Yeah, thanks. See you thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. guys. Bye. Hey, Peg, I have a quick question if you're still okay. on. Okay. Yep. Um, this June 17th, will you be around? We can still use the Zoom room, but I am not sure. We're headed to the cabin and I don't know what kind of internet, even if I take my own, what it's going to be like. So, um, are you not, I, well, I have something, um, we're doing our strategic planning and what, that got postponed from April. Yeah. I so just, I don't know if we're going to have a face to face and I bet if we have a virtual, it won't be all day like it was planned. Okay. So I, I think I, I think I will, but and if I not, might, I'll, we'll play or I'll just have Otis. Um, yeah, well, we'll just, yeah, we'll find somebody else for sure. If, if, once I know, okay. like I said, right now it's on the calendar and it's, I'm assuming it's in at ESU 10, but we had like 
outside people come in for that, you know, teachers or not teachers, but administrators and curriculum people and, you know, from different districts and, and then, um, oh my gosh, where are they from? I can't remember somewhere in Omaha, one of the districts is le facilitating our planning. Mm -hmm. And, um, so those are from outside too. So I don't know if we're going to have it face to face. So. Okay. Sounds good. And it might be fine. I really, I've been there once and I don't remember ever paying attention to my phone, what kind of self service I had to be able to yeah. do the hotspot thing. So I don't know. Might be good. In my <laughs> okay. No, somebody will be there. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.